I do that every time. I'm like, I want to, I want to look, I look at you. Like I'm, this show is for you and I'm going to look you in the eyes. And that's one, one of the best things is like when someone, <laughs> someone isn't really expecting or they don't know your band very well. And they're like, kind of like watching. And then I'll like, look at them and they'll be like, you know, <laughs> it's just like, no, no, no. I was like, look at me. Like, you know, it's really funny. Or if people are just kind of standing there like this, you know, I'll like, I'll drill into them until they're, they're like, Okay, like she sees me standing here like this. I guess I better do something, you know? <laughs> like that's the best moment. But it's like you're not just a face in the crowd, bud. I see you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, when we started 13 years ago, there weren't a lot of women fronting metal bands. I mean, there were quite a few. Um, but, but they were kind of the big names that everybody knows now. Um, Nightwish, Within Temptation, Arch Enemy, in this moment was just kind of getting a start, I think. Um, it was still very, you know, it was, it was kind of an untread path. And um, so we struggled a little bit with people judging us just based on the fact that I was female, um, you know, a female fronted metal band automatically means that you play or you sing symphonic metal. That was just kind of the way it was. Just because mostly I think Nightwish being the biggest female fronted metal band in the world, Within Temptation being pretty close behind, a couple others also being symphonic metal <laughs> really didn't help either. But I mean, not to say that there's anything wrong with that, it's just that that was always everyone's first instinct is to think that, oh, female fronted, symphonic metal. And being that we were most definitely not that, it was hard to get people to look past it and actually try and give us a listen and see that we didn't play symphonic metal and that we were, you know, in our early years, we were struggling a little bit to find our own sound. So it was somewhere between like melodic power death metal, I guess you could call it. Yeah, a lot of times it was just snap decisions on people's part that we, you know, we were a symphonic metal band and they and they didn't bother listening to us. Or the other way around, where they would think that we were a symphonic metal band and listen and be like, oh, sweet, a new Nightwish or another Within Temptation. And then we weren't that and disappointing them. And then there were those that just you know, listened with an open mind and, and became really big fans of us in our early years. And we had a few steadfast flag holders for us back in those days. And we really appreciate that. But that was probably the biggest hurdle, really, was just overcoming that sort of uh, first impression, I guess you could call it. On stage as well, a lot of times we'd get people, you know, with that kind of crossed arms in the back of the room reaction as soon as they see me get up on stage. And uh, so I'd work my ass off to, to prove to them that we weren't just going to be... And like I said, there's nothing wrong with symphonic metal or this aesthetic at all, but we weren't just going to be another pretty girl in a corset singing opera over heavy metal because that was really what was dominating the female-fronted scene at the time. And I, I worked very hard to create something that wasn't that just because we you know we wanted to stand out and we wanted to be something different and we wanted people to talk about us or whatever um just didn't want to you know be another band kind of the way that it can get with male fronted bands as well oh another death metal band oh great you know it's kind of like how how do you stand out how do you figure out a way to be different how do you make people stand up and take notice so that was really kind of what we were going for back in the day was just something new and exciting and we had a lot of people that were really stoked on it you know female fronted power metal was not a thing it was literally not a thing so it was you know it was a long hard road but we always kind of stuck to our guns and it seems to have worked there's two big names that are always the ones that kind of take the spotlight for me especially when it was when it was the early years and I was still trying to figure it out coming from a classical background years and years of singing chamber music and 
musical theater and that kind of thing and just trying to find my own voice and who I was up on stage. The, the two that really influenced me the most and guided me really were Bruce Dickinson and Daniel Hyman from Lost Horizon. So Bruce was kind of this guy who had such an engaging stage presence and he's so exhilarating to watch and he's just, he's like the entertainer for me when it comes to watching a live show. So I got a lot of what I do on stage from watching him and just enjoying their live videos on YouTube or whatever, seeing them live four times now and I'm just, you know, riveted, thrilled every single time. Cause he never, you know, he, he never loses your focus. And uh, I just, yeah. So a lot of what I do is because of him. And also the whole, the whole him watching Iron Maiden perform and then kind of saying, you know what, I could do this. I should be singing in this band. Why, why am I not up there? That was very similar to how I felt watching Scott's band play back in, you know, first year university when we first met. And I'd go to their shows and I'd be like, this is awesome, but I should totally be up there. <laughs> you know? And I, it was exactly the same, exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, always have always loved them. And like still one of the first bands that I really fell in love with and one of the first bands that I just listened to nonstop and was like, oh yeah, you know, like, uh, wow, I love heavy metal. I don't know what I've been doing all these years. And then Daniel was like this light bulb moment when I heard him because it had been, I, we had put out Behold the Devastation and we were working on Demons of the Astro Waste. And I heard Lost Horizon for the first time, thanks to Andrew, who wasn't in the band yet, but <laughs> little did we know. Um, and Grant, one of Grant's favorite bands as well. The both of them were just kind of like, wait, you've never listened to Lost Horizon? Like, what are you doing? Like your voice, you could do this, you could be this. And yeah, so I first listened to it and I was just like, yes, this is what I've been looking for. You know, because I just had been, like I said, trying to come from this classical background, had really struggled with how to not sound like every other singer was sounding at the time and just couldn't find and you know like i was listening to queen's wreck judas priest iron maiden dio i was listening to all of the the greats but i hadn't found my voice yet and it was daniel that really kind of yeah it was a breakthrough for sure and i was just like wow okay i'm doing this and i listened to lost horizon for probably like six months straight and learned everything that he does how he puts that grit in his vocal how he utilizes his range you know in every single song um how he can write over the craziest guitar riffs happening you know it's kind of like the band was just like wanting to wheedly wheedly all the time and it's like oh no yeah that's a verse riff and it's like oh really <laughs> doesn't sound like it but Daniel would still absolutely nail it over top of it with his own crazy, amazing harmony. So, or melody, sorry. And so that was when I was kind of like, heck yeah, you know, I can write, I can write over anything. And uh, that, yeah, that was just this, just like awakening, <laughs> I guess you could call it. <sighs> no pun intended. Personally would be playing 70,000 tons of metal, I guess. Uh, it's a killer festival on a boat <laughs> and it was a lot of fun and it's kind of, at least for us North American bands, it's kind of like a rite of passage, you know, something you gotta do. You gotta do it at one point in your life. I was really excited to almost play Vakken. That was like a big one for me. That was going to be the, you know, the kind of the moment because, you know, the bands that play Vakken are, are just huge in my mind. And I think that Vakken was going to be a huge, uh, you know, a huge experience for us. But of course, COVID, COVID ruins everything. Um, yeah, so we weren't able to play that last year as scheduled. And this year, probably not as well, depending on how things go. But I'm thinking it's a no again. So um, that dream has been squashed for now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd say 70,000 tons of metal. It's really kind of about um, 
knowing who you are and why you want to do this and make sure that you know you're doing it because you love music and and let that be the drive behind you let that be um your motivation because if, <laughs> if you're looking for fame and money in the heavy metal world <laughs> it's not uh it's not really you know it's a hard one it's there are very few that are enjoying you know the perks of of a life of music if if muse if you love heavy metal and that's why you're there that passion will be heard behind the music and people will love you even more for it and um it, yeah and it'll come through and you'll work harder because of it and you will constantly create new music because that drive is always there no one's opinion matters except your own you're gonna get torn down probably in the beginning you're gonna have a lot to learn so just you know let it happen learn it and move on and make changes or whatever but do the thing do it because you want to not because someone says i don't like the way you sound you know that kind of thing if you're happy with what you're doing and and it's fulfilling you then no it doesn't matter what other people say if they don't like this that or the other it's about what makes you happy at the end of the day. You've got to you got to remember that because if you start creating music for other people, you will never be happy and you will never be fulfilled by it. Make sure that you surround yourself with like-minded musicians, those that have the same drive and passion as you do. And it's hard, <laughs> uh, as we can tell you from experience. Sometimes, you know, it takes a little, it takes a few, it takes a few runs at it before you get it right. But don't. You know, don't compromise your dreams for other people and um, save your money because <laughs> you're going to need it. <laughs> and lastly, the most important one of all is respect your fans because without them, you are nothing. And that's literally the truth. Without them, you are nowhere. No one is listening to you. No one is buying your stuff. No one is going to your shows. They are the reason why you exist at the end of the day and you can make music that makes you happy and you make music for yourself but when you're doing that it's going to you know get noticed by other people and they're going to love it just as much as you do and you got to you know you got to bring them into the fold and support them just as much as they support you because as much as big business or mainstream media or even the labels want to just talk about the numbers they're not numbers they're people and they love your music and they buy it and you know they keep you going so make sure that you always just love them <laughs> that's all <laughs>